When my dad was diagnosed, it was bittersweet because I thought it would come to an end. But it was, I was still struggling because it was the only thing I knew was my dad. If someone had told me by the time your dad passes away, it's going to hurt more than you'll ever know because you were losing your best friend, I would have said you're crazy. But that's what happened. Hey. What? Figured out why you like John. What? Why you like to fix things, why you. You make something out of nothing all the time. <laughs> so they got a word for that. What's that word? It's redemption. Redemption? Yeah. Hey. Hey, what is, what is this note here? Right there. What's that note? G. Yeah. What, what's that note? C. C. All right. G to C. You got some competition now, boy. Yeah. Yeah. The biggest kind of moment where I realized I've kind of got an amazing dad was by my junior, senior year, it was when he started kind of going downhill and the hospice kind of moved in. We had a hospice nurse during the day, we had a hospice nurse at night. The night hospice nurse was a guy that my dad really got close to, he was a really cool dude. He got killed in a car accident and it was really traumatic for my dad. And my dad was like, I can't do it again, like don't give me another nurse, I can't go through this. The hospice nurse, she stayed in place and then she kind of broke the rules and was like, I'm just going to report you need only a day nurse. And then she taught me how to give him his medicine as a senior in high school. I would sit with my dad from about two to four in the morning every night and do this. My dad and I had these unbelievable conversations from who I should or shouldn't be dating to what's going to happen after he's gone to apologizing and wanting forgiveness for all the things he had done and there's nothing I look forward to more than being my dad for those couple hours. Every ounce of wisdom that you were supposed to get from your father, it was like we were in the fast lane, like catching up for lost time. That's when it kind of clicked and I realized that this is truly a godly man. Better late than never. So we started with the very beginning of this talking about uh, aff affirmation, talking about how it is that I can only imagine what it would be like to have a father that loves me, that cares for me, will do anything for me, and understanding that that's what God gives us. He gives us affirmation, letting us to know you're doing it, you're doing it. You're learning, you're going, you're going. And then last week we talked about forgiveness. Understanding that no matter what we do, God loves us, forgives us. And so today we're gonna to talk about redemption. But before we do, I, I have a clip because what I have found is that most people believe 
that the video clip that I'm going to show you is who God is. As we're talking to him about everything that's going on in our life, what he's constantly saying to us. We make a mistake, we do this sin, and, and, and then all of a sudden we're back to that point again after we thought we've learned, and we've come right back to that same spot again. Same sin, same problem, same issue. And God, how do I deal with this? What do you say to me? And this is what most people believe God says to them. Uh, Dr. Switzer? Uh, yes, C come in. I'm just, just washing my hands. Uh, I'm Catherine Bigman. Janet Carlisle referred me. Oh, yes. Uh, still being uh, buried alive in a box. Yes. Yes, that's me. <laughs> Should I lay down? Oh, no, no, no. We don't, we don't do that anymore. Just, just have a seat. And uh, let, let me uh, tell you a, a bit about our, our billing. I, um, I charge $5 for the, for the first five minutes. And, and then absolutely nothing after that. How, how, how does that sound? <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> Too good to be true, as a matter of fact. <laughs> well, I can, I can almost guarantee you that, that our session won't last the full, uh, the full five minutes. Now, um, <laughs> we don't do any insurance billing, so you would either have to pay in, in cash or by check. <clears throat> wow, okay. And, uh, and I, I don't make change. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and go. <laughs> go. Well, tell what? me, tell me about the problem that you wish to address. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I have this fear of being buried alive in a box. <laughs> I just, I start thinking about being buried alive, and I begin to panic. Has, has, has anyone ever, ever tried to, to bury you alive in a box? No. No, but truly thinking about it does make my life horrible. I mean, I can't go through tunnels or be in an elevator or in a house. Anything boxy. <laughs> so what, what you're saying is you're, uh, you're claustrophobic. Uh, yes. Yes, that's it. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, let's go, Catherine. I'm... Uh, I'm going to uh, say two words to you right now. I, I want you to listen to them very, very carefully. Then I want you to take them out of the office with you and incorporate them in, into your life. Well, shall I uh, write them down? Well, it, if it makes you comfortable, it's just two words. Most, we find most people can, uh, can remember them. <laughs> okay. You ready? Yes. Okay, here, here they are. Stop it! <laughs> Stop it? Yes. S-T-O-P, new word, I-T. So, what are you saying? <laughs> you, you know, it's funny. I, I, I say two simple words, and I cannot tell you the amount of people who say exactly the same thing you're saying. I mean, this, you know, this is not Yiddish, Catherine. This is English. <laughs> stop it. So, I should just stop it. There you go. I mean, you... you, you you don't want to go through life being scared of being buried alive in a box, do you? I mean, that sounds, sounds frightening. <laughs> yes. Then stop it! I, I can't. I mean, it's been with me no, since no, no, childhood. No, no, no. No, we, 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 we don't go there. Just, just stop. So I should just stop being afraid of being buried alive in a box. You got it. Good go. Well, it's only been... It's only been three minutes, so that will be um, uh, three dollars. Well, I, I only have a five, so. Well, I, I don't, I don't make change. Then I, I guess I'll take the full five minutes. Fine. All right. Well, what other uh, problems would you, would you like to address? <clears throat> Whew, uh, I'm bulimic. I stick my fingers down my throat. Stop it! <laughs> Not of some kind? Don't, don't do that. But I, I'm compelled to. My mom used to call me... No, fatty. no, no. No, no we, we don't go there. But I've been having this dream. No, we don't go there either. But my horoscope did say... We definitely don't go there. Just, <laughs> just stop it. 
what, what, what else? Well, I have self-destructive relationships with men. Stop it! <laughs> you you want to be with a man, don't you? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, yes. Well, then stop it. <laughs> don't be such a big baby. I wash my hands a lot. That's all right. It is? I, I wash my hands all the time. There's a lot of germs out there. Uh -huh. Yeah, don't, don't, uh, don't worry about that one. I'm afraid to drive. Well, stop it! <laughs> How are you going to get around? Get in the car and drive, you, you kook! Stop it! You stop it! You stop it! <sighs> what's, what's the problem, Kathy? Uh, I don't like this. I don't like this therapy at all. You're just telling me to stop it. And, and, you, and you, don't, you don't like that? No, I don't. So you think we're, we're moving too fast, is that it? Yes. Yes, I do. All right, then let me, uh, let me uh, give you ten words that I, I think will uh, clear everything up for you. Uh, you want to you get a pad and a pencil for this one? All right. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. All right, here are the ten words. Stop it or I'll bury you alive in a box! That's how many people perceive God. Is he's looking at all of the issues, all of the problems that we got, and all he's doing is standing up, sitting up there in heaven, and we're talking to him, and he comes back and he just says, Stop it! Just stop it. And every time we come back around to that circle, and every time we come back to him asking him for advice, and all he's telling us to do is just stop it. That's not the way it happens. When God gives us forgiveness, we need to understand what redemption is. And it is not, stop it or I'll bury you alive in a box. That's not what he's going to do to you and all of those things. So, when we started talking about, in the very beginning of this series, we were talking about learning about who are we? What's my identity? And when we, we understand that when you look at Jesus, and people would say, well, who am I? Who are you? He took his identity and he wrapped it up into God. Look at what he said. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because I and the Father are one. He didn't say, hey, God's out there and I'm down here. He says, you want to know who God is? I am the Word. I am He in the flesh. His identity was wrapped up in who He was. And so when He understood exactly who God was, then He understood exactly what it was that God wanted Jesus to do. And when we understand who our identity is, then we're going to understand our purpose. You see, because a lot of times, there are times as Christians that we probably lived out our identity not as a Christian or a child of God. If somebody was to ask you, who are you? You might say, well, I'm a pastor. So who's, what's my identity? My identity is not I'm a Christian. My identity is I'm living it out as to what I'm doing. It may be your job. When somebody asks, who are you? How do you explain to them who you are? Well, I'm the person that lives over here. I'm the person that drives that. I'm the person with this many children. I'm the person with this many grandchildren. Is that our identity? Or do we understand that our identity is not in what we own and what we do or our job? Our identity is in Christ, in Him alone, and nowhere else. You see, in Ephesians chapter 5, in verses 1 and 2, 
We can understand that when we place our identity in anything other than Jesus, then, then we have an issue. Matter of fact, a very serious issue. Here's what he says. Therefore be imitators of God as dearly loved children and walk in love as the Messiah also loved us and gave himself for us a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. So when you understand that when we place our identity in anything other than Jesus, then we are in need of being redeemed. He came to forgive us and to redeem us and to bring us back into the identity that God wants us to be. So many times we need to understand that when Jesus, we see here in his humanity, then we understand that what God totally intended him to for mankind to be from the very beginning. If you turn over to Matthew chapter 5, verses 2 to 12, we're going to read these scriptures, and then we'll break them down. But let me lay some things for you. It's called the Beatitudes, and everybody knows that, and it's a great big part of the scripture from where Jesus was giving what was called the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus was trying to give his sermon to them to help his followers to understand exactly what it was that God wanted them to do or what it meant to be a person of God or in other words, what God had intended them to be and to become restored. Now, the word beatitude means blessing, okay? And so Jesus in these verses is giving eight statements that reveals how God says somehow we can be blessed. Okay? Now, today, we hear the word all of the time. You'll say things to people like, you have a blessed day. Someone sneezes. God bless you. Or, oh, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. And, and we, we, we throw this term around very much because what ends up happening is in our culture today we decide that some that a blessing is as something that you are given for instance if you're at work and you're given a blessing or you're given a bonus then people say oh well I'm blessed if you're giving a child people will say Oh, you're blessed. And sometimes you might want to look at them and say, really? Have you seen this child? Or if you're given a spouse, you're blessed. So look across to the, if you're here together and you're married, look to the person that's right there with you and say to them, I am blessed and so are you. And then you look at each other and say, really? <laughs> because what happens is all of us have this desire that we want to be blessed. Because we assume that what that means is that we'll probably have more than what we did have or we're closer a little bit than what we were before. Well, it's kind of true. You need to understand that Jesus was trying to define really what a blessed person was. And here's what he says. Blessed, um, in, in verse number two, then he began to teach them saying, and here's what he says. Blessed are the poor in spirit because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn for because why they will be comforted blessed are the gentle because they will inherit the earth blessed are those who hunger 
and thirst for righteousness because they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful because they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart because they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers because they will be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness because the kingdom of heaven is there. Blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven. For that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. If you go back and look at the actual Greek of the word blessed, you will find that that word actually is makeros. And in Greek, it literally means someone in an enviable position to receive God's incredible favor and grace. To be in a place where people will envy you because you're in this position of receiving God's grace. And you see, Jesus was helping us to understand this. And that is when you and I receive the grace of God, ladies and gentlemen, it puts us in a place of envy. Because we are given salvation because of the grace and mercy of God. That is blessed. And Michael's going to break it down for y'all in simpler language than I probably ever could. So a blessing is not something we are given. It is a state of living. Let's take a look at this. Who here today has problems in their life? Show of hands. Who here has a health problem? Financial problems? Family problems? People problems? Work problems? Church problems? We got them, right? I mean, you look at our lives and people will be like, well, you live a blessed life. And you're like, did you just see all my hands go up? I only have two hands and I had to keep putting one down to put the other one up. I have problems. You have problems. But yet we are called, it says here, that we are a blessed people. And we look around and we say, there is no way I am that blessed. But the problem is, we perceive blessings in a different way, just as Pastor Chuck said. A blessing is not something we are given. A bonus. Yeah, that's nice to have, but it's not necessarily a blessing. That's a prosperity gospel. Like we said before, we look at, he said, you've been given this child. What a blessing it is. And most of us parents will look and say, they're a blessing when they're sleeping. They're a real blessing. But as soon as they wake up, and I don't know so much. And then when I was sitting back here watching you guys, when you guys were supposed to turn to each other and say, um, oh, you're, I'm blessed. And some of you, I looked at each other and be like, you are so blessed because you're with me. And then some people just wouldn't even look at each other. I don't know what was going on, but you're like, I'm not looking at that person. And, and that's what we got to realize. These blessings aren't something that's just given to us. It's a state of living. And Jesus is a perfect example of how God intended man to be. The Beatitudes are Jesus' definition of who God intended you to be. Living blessed is a result of walking with Jesus. That's what living blessed means. Let's take a look. You can have nothing material in this life, but if you have Jesus, you're blessed. If you've lost a loved one in this life, but if you have Jesus, you're blessed. If you're persecuted for your faith and overlooked because of your convictions, but if you have Jesus, you're blessed. As we walk through these um, beatitudes, these blessings here, we're going to see these truths pop up and, and what it really means. Because once again, in, in, in our lives, 
You guys come to church on Sunday morning, on Sunday night, on Wednesday night. You go to Bible studies. You may know scripture in your heart, but if you can't apply it to your everyday life, you are living wrong. Because these words aren't here to fluff you up, empower you, and make you feel good on Sunday. To walk into Monday morning and say, I mean, I hate Mondays. I can't wait till Tuesday. This Tuesday stinks. Wednesday's hump day. I've made it over the hump. Thursday's awful. Friday, you barely do anything at work. You get to Saturday, you go, I've made it. I've made it to work. And then you get to this point, and you're like, well, Sunday. I get Sunday, I'm re-energized, and then you live life all over again like that. Does that sound like a really great life? Does anybody want to live like that? And most of us live our lives like that. Maybe I'm just describing myself. I don't know. But I, I hear when I go into Monday morning, who here looks forward to Monday mornings? Anybody? Anybody get jazzed up to go to work on Monday? You know, you kick open your car door and you get in the car and you walk into office and you're like, everybody, it's Monday, we're ready to work. And they're like, sit down, do your job, don't sing anymore, it's Monday. And then you come into Tuesday and you're like, oh gosh, I just, Monday was off, I hope I can get through today. And I'll be honest with you, I know how my day is set up, or my week is set up. If I make it through Monday, I can get through my Tuesday meeting. If I get through my Wednesday meeting unscathed, Thursday I can hide in my office and not do a whole lot. Friday I work a little harder and get ready for the weekend and start it all over. That's what work is like. But it shouldn't be like that. We live a blessed life. We have blessings that we need to know about. So let's break it down. The very first one here. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Now we read this and we go, blessed are the poor. And you go, man, I'm poor. I'm going to be blessed. Money is coming my way. That's not what it says. Blessed are those, or, or blessed are the poor in spirit. Jesus is setting up an attitude of humility. If you do not live with humility before God, you cannot live with mercy towards others. And the reason for that being is if you do not live with humility towards God, you will walk into every situation thinking you are the supreme being. That you are the top dog in that conversation, in that relationship, in the room. And when you have that feeling, you're not going to receive a blessing because you're already receiving the blessing that you've been given yourself, thinking you're the best. It's pride. It's haughtiness. We have to live our lives knowing, knowing that we've been given something far greater than we should ever have received. Let me give you this. You ever been in, you ever gotten a bill that you couldn't pay? Nobody in here, everyone's gotten a bill, you know, I can pay this easy. Yeah, of course, you've gotten a bill. Say, I'm gonna say it's a $100 bill. You look at it and you go, I'm sorry, a bill for $200. I got a bill for $200. I only have $100 in my bank account. What do you do? Most of us go, I'm going to act like I didn't see that and just put it right there. And I'm going to go out and I'm going to spend this $100 on something I don't need because I feel so bad. But in reality, what happens is we know that we're in a bad situation. We're very well aware of the fact that we have something that we cannot afford. You see, When Jesus gives the invitation for a lifestyle of being poor in spirit, he's saying that every day we must approach God being aware of two things. We approach him fully aware that we have nothing to offer him. When we wake up every single day, we have nothing to offer God. And what, honestly, what could we give God? He's the creator of the universe. Do you guys know how big the universe is? We can't even fathom it. You know that we can only fathom 5% of the universe. The smartest minds in the world, Albert Einstein, Neil deGrasse Tyson, um, Stephen Hawking, all these individuals that we know are really intelligent, they were only observing 5% of the universe. They said the other 95% is what they call dark matter. 95% of the universe is unobservable. What does that say about our Creator? We're only observing 5% of the universe that He created. And we can't fathom 95% of it, but we know what's going on in this world. We don't have a clue, and we have nothing to offer the Creator who made all that up. 
So we have to come fully aware that we have nothing to offer to God. We must approach God fully aware that He has everything we need. So if we have nothing to offer and He has everything we need, when we begin with those two truths, we place ourselves in a position to be redeemed. We are no longer trying to restore ourselves, but we relinquish control so that God can do only what He can do. When Pastor Chuck was up here talking during the songs when he was saying, we should be asking God, what do you want me to do? This is what it means to be poor in spirit when we come to Him and say, I know the ideas that I have, my dreams that I have, everything that I have doesn't even come close as to what you could give me. So Father, please give me a task and then empower me with that task. That is what it means to be poor in spirit. When we relinquish control, we are saying, God, you know best. The next one, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. It's easy to read this statement and say, oh yeah, I mourn all the time. I cry for the people that I've lost. But that's not what this is saying here. He's saying, blessed are those who mourn. He's talking about mourning sinfulness and brokenness, which sadness and circumstances are a result of. We mourn our own brokenness and our brokenness of our world. So we look at that and we can say, well, that's easy. I can really mourn this world because this world is awful. Have you ever been in a bad situation from other people in this world? Yeah. You ever come across a jerk? Don't look to your left or right. Have you ever been in a place where you were just treated poorly and you're like, why was I treated like that? It's because we live in a broken, sinful world. I mean, it's on a daily basis, some of the crazy things going on in this world. How many of you guys watch the nightly news? Read the newspaper? Quit doing it, okay? Quit watching that nightly news. Because what, <laughs> honestly, what do, they, what do they, is there anything good reported on the nightly news? What is it? How many, it's, it's generally, they're talking about some victim that was shot, somebody that was kidnapped, a, a fire. Because when they come out with those headlines, they get all excited, right? You ever seen a weatherman when a tornado is coming in? Oh man, they're all jazzed up. Well, there's a tornado coming and it's going to destroy lots of lives. But let's watch every bit of it. And we're all like, yep, yep, let's turn it on. Wow, that home just got destroyed. What a shame. And then the, the uh, weatherman's over there just like, he's really like, did you see that? This is amazing. No, it's not amazing when someone's life is destroyed. There's brokenness in this world. And we should mourn that. But before we can mourn other people's brokenness, we must mourn our own. You see, when we relinquish control of our lives, it should open us up to realize how broken we truly are. Some of you remain crippled by guilt of things you've done in the past. Some of you remain crippled by the thoughts and anxieties and the feelings and frustration and the depression that you have in your life. Some of us are mourning our own sinfulness. What he's saying is when we mourn the sinfulness in our own lives, when we have a contrite, broken heart over the things in our lives that are not godly, and then we look at the world and say, God, this world needs to be redeemed. Look at the brokenness, the families that are hurting, the individuals that are broken by addiction and crime and famine and all these other issues. When we, our heart breaks over those things, it says that you will be comforted. You find comfort because He's giving it to you. Remember, there's nothing we can do for ourselves, but everything comes from the grace of God. 2 Corinthians 4, 16-18 says, Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an external or eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Does that resonate with any of you at all? How many of you feel your bodies are deteriorating and wasting away? But inwardly, we are as strong as we ever were before. Why? Because we put our hope in Jesus Christ. Our faith in Jesus Christ, who is saving us for an eternal glory that far outweighs everything of this world. That's what it means when he says, I will comfort you. Knowing that a reward and glory awaits you. 
for remaining hopeful in Jesus. When we mourn, we recognize that God is above all, and we lift our eyes to him. In Colossians, it says, look to the right hand of God. Well, who's at the right hand of God? It's Jesus. Fix your eyes upon him, and he will save you. He continues on, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. The poor in spirit is an inward understanding of our humility before God and our great need for him, whereas meekness is an outward expression of our humility before God so that others can see God in us and not see the person standing before them. Meekness is not weakness. But in this world, it is viewed as such. People want to rule things with a strong, firm, authoritative grip on this world. But if we stand before others as meek and mild, that is what makes the difference. Standing before somebody and letting our humility show through. People throughout history do whatever it takes, often to the detriment of others to build themselves up and improve their appearances to the world. But Jesus sacrificed all appearances to allow himself to be crucified on our behalf. And denying himself worldly praise and exaltation, Christ's meekness demonstrates the truth of the gospel. We don't need to tear others down to build ourselves up. That's what it means. That's what meekness is. Have you ever been in a situation where it's easy to tear somebody else down just to stand on top of them and be, look, I'm triumphant. But what you do is you just mount up a pile of bodies. And what happens to those pile of bodies when they decay and they crumble? Well, guess what? You crumble with them. We don't need to build ourselves up on the failures of others, but what we do need to do is stand firm in the faith of Jesus Christ and be meek as he was meek. And when you think about Christ's example of dying on the cross, the Savior of the world submitted himself to be hung on a dirty tree so that you and I could experience life. Jesus continues, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. When we are hungry and thirsty, whether physically or spiritually, we are reminded of a need of something outside ourselves. Have you ever been hungry and thirsty? When you're little, you're in the backseat of the car on a long trip. I'm thirsty. What'd they tell you? Wait, we're going to, just wait, we're almost there. What's almost? Four hours. I don't think I'm going to make it that long. RJ the other day asked me when he get a drink at night. And he says, I'm really thirsty. I'm like, I think you're going to make it. And he goes, what if I die of dehydration? I'm like, you'll make it eight hours. It'll be okay. We as parents say those things, don't we? You ever heard drink your own spit? Yeah. And as a kid, you've tried it, and you're like, it doesn't work. I'm still thirsty. We have a need outside of ourselves that we can't fulfill. But the Father says, you will be filled. Some of you are thinking, I'm kind of hungry right now. If only I, he would finish this up and we could leave and go get lunch. But what are you hungry for? Jesus says, the blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, obedience to God. When we are thirsting for that, we will be filled. Do we crave a life that pleases God more than anything? The next one, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. There is a distinction between grace and mercy. This is really important. I'll say it slow. Grace is not getting what we do deserve, but mercy is getting what we do not deserve. I'm going to say that again. Grace is not getting what we do deserve, but mercy is getting what we do not deserve. So grace is we don't get the punishment we do deserve, but mercy is receiving something we shouldn't have received in the first place. So grace is bypassing the punishment. Mercy is being given extra. So not only do we escape the punishment of death, but God gives us life. You see that? Grace and mercy. Isn't that a wonderful thing? So it says, blessed are those who are merciful. That means we need to be givers. We need to be people who give of ourselves, our talent, our time, our money to other people to show them mercy as you have been shown mercy. 
Jesus goes on to say, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. This is a simple, profound statement, essentially asking, whose kingdom are you building? Whose kingdom are you building? Your own or God's? The last one here, blessed are the peacemakers, the persecuted, and the slandered. I combine those three. This is a picture of the cross. To the Romans, the cross was a symbol of a failed revolution. To the Jews, hanging on a tree meant you were cursed. So as Jesus was hanging on the cross, everyone looking upon him, wouldn't, they wouldn't have seen a blessed person. They would have seen a cursed person and a complete failure. On top of that, Jesus had not sparked a revolution that the Jews thought that, that he was going to bring. Instead, it was a failed movement. But instead, what was Jesus bringing about to the world? He was bringing redemption. He was bringing redemption. And just as we saw in the very first video with Bart saying, when his dad was saying, what's that word, what's that mean when you just create things from nothing, when you make things? And Bart turns around and he says, that's redemption. When God takes a pile of rubble, which our lives are, a trash heap, failures, and he takes all of that and he makes it something brand new and beautiful. That's why he calls us his trophies. Because he takes something from nothing, this, this life that we have that was a complete wreck, and he transforms it into something miraculous and something wonderful and something beautiful to the rest of the world. And that is what he means when he says, blessed are the, those who are poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who are gentle, those who hunger for righteousness, those who are filled with mercy, those who are pure in heart. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. That's what it means to be redeemed. So let me give you an illustration. Let me give you an illustration from forgiveness to uh, redemption. And hopefully it will become clear to you to understand exactly what we're talking about. Because every one of us, uh, we will travel from place to place. And, and life it, it is the same thing. It, it's, a, it's a journey. And so what ends up happening is, we start here with, with our birth, and we end here. In our death, when we all die. That's going to happen to every one of us. Okay? So we start out this journey, and as Christians, here's what happens. We, we start out this journey, and we come down through here, and we, hear, we hit this point when we understand that we need Christ. And so we hit this point here called forgiveness. Marker. Now start. So we begin as we're coming from birth and we get this forgiveness and we start walking on this path to where we're trying to go to in pleasing of God. And what ends up happening is we end up sinning. And we think, okay, now we, we've cut it. It's kind of like um, you're, you're going from place to place and all of a sudden you're on a journey and one of the kids says, hey, mom, dad, we got to stop after a break or we got to eat or something and so what ends up happening is you end up having to divert from, from that, that journey and that path and it's the same thing in life because what ends up happening is that as you begin to start walking in Christ you hit this point and, and something happens and you think okay I blew it I'm going right back to doing the same thing that I used to do. And God, I thought we got rid of that. And God says, okay. So you come back to God and you say, God, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean that. And he says, okay, good. So what ends up happening? Maybe there he's trying to teach you meekness. And so what ends up happening is we end up going further down in this journey. And as we get down in this journey, we hit maybe the same point again. We do the same thing all over again. And then we come to the same spot and we say, okay, God, what is this? I thought 
I got over this. I thought I wasn't doing this anymore. You've forgiven me. And, and God, I'm so sorry and all of this stuff. And he says, okay, it's cool. Because out of that, maybe he's trying to teach you humility. And so what ends up happening all through our lives, ladies and gentlemen, is we keep doing this. And everybody keeps asking the same question. Why am I going round and round and round in circles? Why do I keep coming back to the same point every time? Every time, Lord. I keep coming right back to that same point. This, ladies and gentlemen, is when we hit forgiveness, working towards in here. Towards redemption. And so what happens is, as I shared in Sunday school, what happens is our life, our life becomes this slinky. And it just keeps unraveling and unraveling and unraveling. But what ends up happening is every time we hit these points, God is teaching us something. He's trying to help us learn something. Blessed are the meek in spirit. Blessed are the humble. Blessed are the persecuted. Blessed are, are the peacemakers. Blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. Every one of these is that. And so what ends up happening is, what he does is he ties all of that up together. And when you look at that slinky, you don't know where those points were. And this is where we come to, and what I was trying to say to you this morning, in all of this, is to understand forgiveness to redemption is you ask Jesus what or you listen to him where he says, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? God, I failed you, but I learned meekness. And I understand that meekness. So, so what is it that you want me to do? Help me to take that meekness and show others how to be meek. Help me to show that humility in my life to other people. That's what I want you to do. I want you to bring me into a closer relationship so that you and I, Jesus, become one. That that slinky of your life, ladies and gentlemen, is all bound up in the forgiveness of Christ and it can't be torn apart. Because now you know who you are in Christ. Jesus knew who he was in God. My question is, do you know who you are in Christ? I got my second epith epiphany this week. Even before, but I had it affirmed as to what it is, God, you want me to do. I've already shared it with you all, and I know exactly what it is that God wants me to do. Finish well. Finish well. Which means there is no retirement in the life of a Christian. You know what retirement is as a Christian? Death. When I die. So, if I don't pastor anymore, I am not retiring. Somebody says, well, you're retiring from pastoring? I may retire from pastoring at some point in time, but I'm not retiring from the work of Jesus Christ. Why? Because I know exactly what it is that he's, that he's wanting me to do. No clue about it. Or, I'm sorry. No doubt about it. There is no clue where it's going to take me or what it's going to do with it. But I know one thing. I know the journey that I'm on. And I've been seeing it for a long time and, it, and, I, and I got it. And this week it brought into clarity what it is exactly that God wants me to do. And so, am I pumped? Absolutely. Is there things that are going to change? Absolutely. You're going to see a whole bunch of changes. But that's okay. Change is good. Change needs to happen. It's, it's, a, it's a point, and let me share with you real quick where I'm at. 
I've been worried so much about mentoring people. And, and don't get me wrong, I'm still going to mentor people, and, and, and that's a, an aspect that I'll never get away from. But I'm coming to a point, I'm going to get in your face. And I'm going to ask you this question. What is God doing in your life? So ladies and gentlemen, you better figure it out. Because God has brought me here to help you on that journey. To figure it out, what it is that God is doing in your life. You keep wondering, why do I keep going around and around and around and around and around? How long is this slinky? What am I learning? The question is, what are you learning from this? Every event in your life, ladies and gentlemen, God is a God-appointed divine appointment. And you need to learn from it. If you don't learn from it, you're going to get stuck. And God wants you to get unstuck. I told you, I came here not to build a church, but to build a kingdom. This week, and, and I've been asking the same question. God, why are you bringing people into my life that are alcoholics? I don't know how to talk to them. I am not an alcoholic. I don't know how to deal with this issue of alcoholism. God, why are you bringing people in my life that are drug addicts? I've never used a drug in my life except Coke, good Coke. <laughs> never. Then God, how in the world am I supposed to relate to these people? God, why are you bringing all of these people that are losing their children? I don't know how to relate to them. I don't know what to say to them. God, I'm wrong. God says, I'm bringing these people in your life because you need to help them figure out what am I trying to do? And you need to join me. You need to see because you already, you understand this. I look to see where God is working and I go join him. So why is God bringing all you all into my life? Because God wants me to look at you and get you straight and see what it is that God's doing and let's join together. Hello, this is Pastor Chuck Cotton from Calvary Baptist Church. First of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for taking the time out to either listen to our sermon or to watch it on video. We are grateful that you've actually taken the time and hope and pray that it has been a blessing to you as it was to us as we delivered it to our congregation. We ask if you have any questions whatsoever that you email us at Pastor Chuck at CalvaryBaptistMiddletown.org or you could come in and give us a phone call if you would please at area code 513-423-7251. I'd like to take this opportunity to also invite you to come to our church and visit us if you would please. We actually have small groups on Sunday morning starting at 9.30 with our morning worship following at 10.45. Prior to our morning um, small groups, we also provide donuts with coffee, um, milk, orange juice, the time for fellowship, get to know each other, have a good time before we actually break out into our small groups. For Sunday. Our worship services are uplifting, they're fast moving, and everything in our service is just a fast pace. But we do take time every once in a while to slow down as we feel the Holy Spirit moving, and we never want to hinder it in any way. We also have on Sunday evening, and during the school year, we have Awana, and Awana starts with the Puggles, actually from age two all the way up through high school. And during that period of time, we also have a worship service. Both of these start at 6 o'clock and end at 7.30. Our Wednesday night, we have a Bible study, which starts at 7. We generally finish about 8.15. We would love for you to come and visit with us. Don't have to dress up. Just come as you are, because to us, it doesn't matter. You're, you're a child of God, a creation of His, and so to us, you're important to everything that we do. Our motto here is building the kingdom one life at a time. And we hope that we have a chance to visit with you, get to know you as you get to know us. So thank you and may God bless you.